All right, so let's start this uh, cultural economics online uh, seminar. Uh, we are very pleased uh, to uh, introduce uh, Christian Hanke and Carolina della Chiesa, who today will present uh, on the art of crowdfunding arts and innovation, the cultural economic perspective. This is a brand new paper that has just uh, been released on uh, the Journal of Cultural Economics. Uh, so you're very welcome, uh, uh, if you haven't done so yet, uh, to, to have a look also at the paper online. Um, Christian Hanke is uh, Associate Professor of Cultural Economics at Erasmus University Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And uh, Carolina de la Chiesa is a postdoctoral researcher at Leuphana University in Lüneburg, Germany. And sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Elisabetta Lazzaro, Professor of uh, Creative and Culture Industries Management at the University for the Creative Arts uh, in the UK. And uh, the floor is yours. Uh, so um, Christian, um, a couple of minutes ago, um, uh, uh, expressed his uh, um, uh, desire to have a, an interactive uh, presentation. So please all feel free to interrupt by uh, raising questions. So please uh, use your hands on Zoom and uh, don't be shy. If you are really shy, uh, there is still uh, the option of writing your message in the chat and I will take care of it. So Christian and Carolina, please, you can start. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Elisabetta. Uh, thanks also to Andre, Marie and Therese for organizing this uh, cultural economics online seminar series. Much appreciated, even though I can't always attend. Um, I very much appreciate the uh, invitation. Um, OK, so we've got an exciting topic and a difficult paper. <clears throat> I get to the intricacies of the particular paper as well. And of course, I appreciate that some of you are interested in particular aspects of it. Crowdfunding is a cross-cutting issues these days. It's amazing how much attention the storm in the teacup has received. Some of, we have of course, prominent authors uh, on crowdfunding uh, in the audience today. Uh, there are literally hundreds of empirical papers uh, on crowdfunding and um, um, and I constantly receive new alerts on new contributions on the subject, considering that it doesn't amount to that big a share in, in actual uh, provisions of revenues or, rev or investment in culture, um, uh, it really sees a lot of attention and I think for good reasons. Now, uh, this paper is rather different from the conventions in the crowdfunding literature, which is very much empirics based for very good reasons, because of course, all of this happens on online and many of the platforms share uh, useful data, which is really an exciting opportunity. What we try to do in this paper is um, we try to survey and contextualize, um, which is, um, well, uh, Carolina enjoy, enjoyed this. It was a very enjoyable um, process. And we also do think that we go, um, go beyond uh, some well-established ideas in, in some respects. Let me test that out with you. Uh, nonetheless, the format of the paper has not always been universally, well, it hasn't always been received particularly well. Um, so let me be clear about a couple of points right from the start. Um, we, Carolina and I, seek to um, identify first, identify typical aspects of crowdfunding by and for um, creation, uh, creative projects. Second, we illustrate or we seek to illustrate how virtually all of these relate to long term, long standing themes in cultural economics. And third, um, we want to discuss how these themes interact and fit together. Uh, to um, explain crowdfunding practices. So in order to make that work in a presentation, in my humble experience, since we have the time, please do interrupt at any point in time. Maybe not quite just yet because I'm just doing the preliminaries. The basic point is please interrupt and feel free to ask questions at any point in time regarding your interests in IP or how it relates to empirics or whatever it may be. 
Okay. Um, so let me go to my first slide, which isn't all that easy, apparently. The slides are stalled for some reason. Ah, here we go. So first point, maybe it's not quite a surprise that much of what of what the generic crowdfunding literature is discussing um, often relates to cultural economics, because crowdfunding is an idea, an innovation hatched in the cultural sector. Uh, the first crowdfunding websites um, were had to do with financing uh, cultural projects. Uh, projects by now, by now, of course, crowdfunding has been applied uh, in the rest of the world. And uh, in terms of revenues generated, it's much bigger in some areas. But nonetheless, it started. And maybe there's a reason for it. And maybe that has to do with some economic characteristics found in the cultural sector and, and maybe sometimes also found um, elsewhere. So um, the main purpose um, or what we what we're doing in the paper is we develop a unique perspective hopefully on uh, that focuses on creators of cultural products and predominant crowdfunding practices to finance cultural production i'll get to those in a minute uh, second we are harnessing general themes in cultural economics for that purpose and third we want to develop um, new combinations and insights for the generic crowdfunding literature so um, there are two dimensions here. On the one hand, we try to inform cultural economists about the potential for crowdfunding research to help us better understand how the cultural sector works. Because after all, what does crowdfunding do? It is shifting the constraints uh, of for many agents and thus reveals, uh, reveals preferences and enables new interactions between creators, investors and users. And sometimes, of course, uh, the respective roles blend into each other and become um, uh, almost unrecognizable occasionally. What is an, who is an investor? Who is a user? Um, what it also does, what crowdfunding also does, as I mentioned before, it, it creates abundant data on how people respond to different um, incentives post um, dangled in front of their faces uh, in crowdfunding calls that have to do with how they might be able to engage with the cultural products and the cultural um, um, projects envisaged in calls. Um, we're also trying, uh, regarding the gener generic crowdfunding literature, uh, we try to alert contributors, contributors that, that um, they are often not the first to discover and discuss the conflation and interdependence of issue, issues such as um, uh, uncertainty of demand or uncertainty of quality, combined with intrinsic motivation uh, to participate in creative projects, public good attributes, socially interdependent demand formation and quality signaling. And I think there's a tendency in the generic um, crowdfunding literature sometimes to be like to stumble on intrinsic motivation, and go, whoa, we discovered something new. And lo and behold, that's not quite the case, of course, at least not for the community of people listening today. So you may read this paper on the one hand as a call for action for cultural economists and uh, secondly as a sales pitch on behalf of cultural economics to a very, very big group of people who have been publishing on uh, crowdfunding from various perspectives, very often from various microeconomic perspectives. And then last but not least, um, so, uh, sorry, um, what I'm doing here with this image, of course, is already um, teasing the idea that I think certain building blocks, longstanding themes in cultural economics can help us understand uh, the crowdfunding, crowdfunding practices, the crowdfunding phenomena, and answer some practical questions that I come to uh, in a minute on top of what I just talked about uh, are the you know, practices in academia. Um, and the point is not just to list certain, you know, basic economic characteristics of the cultural sector and what the respective literatures have to say, but also how these things interact, because that's the exciting thing about crowdfunding, that it is a very versatile tool that uh, um, enables, uh, provides lots of uh, possibility for product differentiation and catering for people with different uh, expectations um, uh, under different circumstances, often simultaneously to give various people um, exactly what they want um, and to broaden the market in this sense. 
Okay, so the practical questions are, uh, are these. Um, so th these might also be interesting for stakeholders to actually look to apply crowdfunding. So on the one hand, uh, under what circumstances is crowdfunding a superior alternative to traded means of financing innovative projects, such as cultural products? Second, uh, what types of crowdfunding are best suited for specific cultural and creative industries? And what is the potential for crowdfunding for cultural um, and creative industries? And I think you'll, you'll leave this seminar hopefully with slightly better qu uh, answers to these questions. Um, even though, of course, um, some of this is also a call, the aforementioned call to action. So um, here's an overview of what crowdfunding does. In the paper, obviously, we go into slightly more detail. But in essence, it's an aspect of platformization of many markets, including in the cultural sector. Um, we have other platforms that don't do crowdfunding, but virtually all crowdfunding online, and that's almost synonymous. There have been uh, open calls to contribute to the financing of cultural projects before the internet. But when we talk about crowdfunding, the coin was termed um, for uh, internet platforms that conduct these kind of services. And you have founders that provide info, upload info on crowdfunding platforms. Crowdfunding platforms provide templates for project information, filing and recommendation systems. So they provide standardized solutions, them, uh, including standardized contractual terms between founders and backers. This information on projects and the terms under which anybody can support these projects is then relayed to backers who select and support projects, um, and then selectively backers um, um, contribute money. Um, the crowdfunding platform um, provides a, pl a vehicle for monetary transactions and the money then eventually um, under certain conditions may arrive with the founders who then develop and um, execute the project that so far they've only uh, developed as a, um, as a suggestion. And other communication channels might be quite important. Um, the on reputation that and people enjoy, um, often also social media, in addition to what happens on the crowdfunding platform, might be considered. That's the basic. Okay, that's just somebody joining us. Again, open invitation to interrupt me any point in, uh, at any point in time. I hope so far this is reasonably uncontentious. And then let me go into something perhaps that might be a bit more uh, contentious, and this is an overview of, or a very sketchy history of um, of crowdfunding platforms. We've got them listed by the foundation year. Um, territory served are not all that interesting. May industry served always includes cultural and creative industries, but often also um, they expand it um, into other uh, parts of the economy. And the main thing I want to alert you to is uh, a standard that might be behind these, the selective list of big crowdfunding flat platforms to do with col uh, culture. And that is that we have, um, that we have um, award-based crowdfunding so that people, uh, f um, backers receive something in return, often the access, preferred preferential access to once the product has actually been created. Pre-selling might be a, a common notion here. Sometimes also there are exclusive perks, things that are not actually sold in a market, uh, even after uh, the, the um, uh, pro, uh, project has come to fruition. But re reward-based crowdfunding is the norms and all or nothing setups are the norm as opposed to keep it all as setups. So in all or nothing setups, a certain threshold has to be met. A, a crowdfunding target is set. And unless that uh, that amount is raised um, through the crowdfunding campaign, as long as it's open, you would have, um, you would have uh, the project not commence and the, uh, and the uh, backers of a unsuccessful call would be reimbursed. And that's a very important strategy to mitigate uh, risk on the side uh, of the backers. Okay, so what this sketchy, very sketchy overview or, you know, in the paper, it's more of a history um, uh, of crowdfunding entails. There are three points. First of all, as I mentioned, reward-based crowdfunding and all or nothing setups are the norm in, um, in cultural production today. Second, um, 
Uh, also, uh, also, and, and we try to, of course, any any explanations we develop have to be consistent or preferably explain why that would be the case. Nonetheless, there has been some experimentation with various other um, aspects of crowdfunding. Patreon would be an obvious example where it's not a specific uh, creative project, but a series of projects by the same contributors that are being financed um, over over time by more permanent, well, what you, whatever you want to call them, backers that act more like subscribers, perhaps. Um, so there's some variation and subject to the particular circumstances, potential founders, creators of, of, of cultural products get to choose between various setups uh, offered by various platforms. Second, uh, the conditions differ across the cultural and creative industries. We're all all familiar with the fact that, you know, this is a very diverse, a very diverse field and specific stakeholders um, also it, um, the, um, um, circumstances and ambitions differ between uh, various uh, types of stakeholders. For instance, um, what culture and creative industries, or if you want to finance a movie, it's a very complex, very costly uh, cultural product to create. You have fundamentally different um, costs and also the need to organize production, coordinate a very complex team. And that's quite different from, you know, creating a novel or a simple creative product, like maybe an individual painting. Furthermore, there's great hope that uh, cultural industries would, um, that cultural products, uh, sorry, that crowdfunding would mitigate superstar effects and maybe even uh, uh, create a more competitive or more equitable um, situation in the cultural and creative industries. But there's actually not, you know, very strong evidence for that. I'll discuss that in a minute. And then the, the third point coming from this overview of, of um, state of the art and crowdfunding petrol, um, um, practices um, is that um, there's a big question on how best to adapt crowdfunding setups to specific circumstances. Um, a, a crowdfunding setup that maximizes the probability of success for a superstar endorsed movie project may not do so for newcomers in, uh, in fine arts. And, um, um, you know, some people in the room might point me to the adequate uh, things to read, but I haven't, I haven't been very satisfied with that, with, that, with what I found so far uh, regarding this kind of overview uh, of uh, selective matching of crowdfunding options to specific circumstances. And I think that requires much more attention. Good. So I promised that I would relate or that the whole paper is structured by main themes in cultural economics. And maybe in this audience, there will be people who will, you know, have suggestions regarding this or um, pushback. Um, but uh, to my reading, um, main themes in cultural economics, uh, you know, I acknowledge eight in the paper. We acknowledge eight in the paper. First, we have a cost structure with the high sunk costs of creation relative to non-marginal costs. Uh, demand uncertainty is, is central. Differentiated products and differentiated preferences are, are, are central. We've got experience good attributes of creative works, that is, um, potential buyers or users are um, ill-informed and inc are make irreversible decisions commit some time or money before they have complete information of all the options available to them or how much they will actually enjoy the experience provided by a particular creative work fifth we have public good attributes of creative works um, six social interdependent demand formation which um, i always um, refer to the late mark blauk in this respect that's uh, you know a wonderful treatment of that in his 2001 paper Seventh, intrinsic motivation to create an eighth, uh, an eight diverse values of creative works and crowding effects. Any reactions on that so far? Or can we go, uh, what I will do for the rest, for much of the rest of the presentation is go through these various items and then in the end, put them together. It, but I would like to uh, pose the question and open the floor to reactions, whether uh, this overview is, um, well, um it seems at least agreeable obviously you know it's not going to be perfect for all um for all ambitions any reactions uh, here i i have a reaction uh, so uh also because uh, you just mentioned the superstar uh theory um 
I, I suppose this list is not exhaustive. Uh, so what are the criteria you adopted uh, in uh, um, including these uh, themes uh, uh, instead of other possible ones? Well, uh, I've been working on this quite a bit and I get to teach the basics of cultural economics quite a bit. And obviously you have to, you know, when you create any kind of overview, when you want to communicate to any audience, be it students, be it colleagues, um, you have to, well, decide what you think are the most important um, key elements of starting to understand the economic characteristics of the cultural sector. And in my humble opinion, this is obviously not absolutely exhaustive, but I think it goes pretty far, especially, of course, when you realize that um, I think many further economic attributes or characteristics of cultural industries that are um, can be treated as sub points of any of these eight. And of course, these eight are already related together. So the selection criteria were um, not entirely systematic. Um, it's my reading of the literature and it's my reading also, of course, of what turned out to be useful in trying to explain the crowdfunding phenomena. So this is not supposed to be the ultimate list, if there is any such thing. Richard Cage has a famous one, you know, that has seven items and it's, it's more, comes more in slogans like nobody knows or time is of the essence and things like that. Um, but for our purposes, this served us really well in trying to get ahead around um, crowdfunding practices. Did I miss anything important? I'm very, I'd be very happy to hear what you think we should have explicitly acknowledged at this level of the paper, right? Of giving the key points and creating a structure for the rest of the paper. Any idea among the audience? This could be a little quiz. I think Stephen would like to, um, Stephen, I think you can just start. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just have one, it may be premature, you may be planning on addressing this issue, but um, I haven't tried all of the platforms you listed on the previous uh, slide, but I have personally tried uh, three of them, Patreon, Kickstarter, and Indiegogo. Um, Patreon in particular has a couple of interesting alternative modes of support that uh, would seem to have an implica implications for how risk is distributed between the supporter or demand and the artist or supply. In particular, on Patreon, while many or even most of the artists seem to solicit support per time period, so a certain amount of payment per month, there are some who uh, solicit payment per work produced. And uh, that seems quite interesting. I don't know if data are available from Patreon to explore the alternative success of these modes of soliciting support, but that seems to me to be an interesting issue that might be worthy of exploration. Absolutely. There is a paper on Patreon in the Journal of Cultural Economics that precedes our paper, actually, and we reference it. But this, uh, and um, so since that had been covered reasonably well in the very journal, and since this is still a, a growing thing, Patreon has, you know, has, has grown um, substantially, but um, the subscription-based crowdfunding is indeed, as you mentioned, slightly different. I would agree with you that it's an interesting way of allocating risk, which is, of course, very important in the whole crowdfunding thing, one of many important interrelated items, uh, features of this practice, um, is indeed if you have like a fixed payment over time, it's a bit like an employment contract and there's greater risk for those people who commit a fixed payment over time because they don't pay for something that is slightly more clearly announced, like we will do this and by that date we will have a theatrical performance. 
yeah you don't know quite how many videos quite how many services um will be actually generated over that uh, time frame um yeah but but they're mixing that on patreon as well um and it's one of the levers or setups that that you can vary um i completely agree with you you're in one way we completely agree F first of all no we have not studied that in detail i don't think there's a i'm not aware of a brilliant paper that covered this issue yet but it would be one of, uh, certainly worthy of study and um i think it's part of the selective matching of crowdfunding setups all the options that you have available to particular circumstances what works best for whom yeah if you have somebody with a glorious reputation for regular being very productive for years then it, there might be much it might be much easier for them to get people to commit to a subscription than somebody who has had one or two videos out because you just don't know whether they can keep up a good performance in quantity and quality over sustained periods of time. Um, Carolina is has switched the camera on. I'm not sure whether that means she wants to say something. Yeah, yeah. I switched the camera on just to uh, mention very briefly. Well, as you can see, I'm here in the train. But uh, if you want to go further in data about Patreon, you can take a look in Gravetron, uh, which is the website that compiles all the information uh, on uh, the revenues uh, for Patreon. Also, we have here in the audience uh, Wojciech, who is um, also uh, dealing with a lot of data from Patreon, so we can have an interesting discussion later about it. But, but certainly there is a, a huge amount of data available which you can you know, freely use uh, from Patreon. And of course, the model is slightly different because it's a subscription based. But I believe just uh, complementing what Christian said, um, whether the uh, subscription or all or nothing, the main things of culture economics still remain important for our uh, objectives of the paper. So, um, well, later I can send the grave trend link here for you if you'll be interested, okay? Wonderful. Um, getting back to this uh, to this list, um, we have some qualifiers in the paper, you know, saying that some, you know, it's a bit hard to disentangle this. Uh, there's some chicken and egg problems. So, for instance, um, um, social independent demand formation might be looked at as the consequence of demand uncertainty and experience good attributes, or you could turn it around and say people like to interact about these things, but then social contagion hurt behavior creates demand uncertainty so there's some difficulties which i um, which i appreciate uh, nonetheless maybe as we are still with this list and as i wrap up this uh, this slide uh, i think it's actually quite important for us as cultural economists to stick our neck out and make explicit these kind of economic characteristics that we uh, that we engage with that we assume um not axiomatically because there's lots of empirical research behind this uh, but why do we assume this and what are the what's the combination of this i think this might make for much better and much more sophisticated analysis if we have these kind of lists because then we can also start talking about the interaction between these items which is i think the big um boundary the big the big well, there's a huge potential um, for a much more sophisticated analysis and novel uh, insights when we creatively relate these various um, uh, characteristics to one another. And then it might not even be so important what is the egg and what's the hen and so on. Yeah. Um, but I know I'm sticking my leg, I'm deliberately sticking my neck out with this. And um, obviously, uh, it's easy to shoot this down as not being perfect. Um, it might be slightly harder to criticize, uh, to, to make constructive criticisms. And uh, yeah, I'd be pointers for that are very welcome also after this uh, presentation has concluded. Elisabetta has a comment still. Yeah, sorry, Christian. Perhaps it's worth uh, mentioning, uh, especially to uh, those who are not so uh, familiar with crowdfunding, uh, uh, because I don't think the the word has uh, ever been uh, said so far that we are mainly um, talking about uh, uh, reward donation crowdfunding. Because, uh, for instance, you were mentioning uh, the movie industries, and as we know, the movie industry is also using uh, um, equity crowdfunding. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, they certainly do. Um, um, absolutely. So equity would be when you when uh, equity crowdfunding when you when you invest, um, and you actually expect uh, a pecuniary return on your investment. That's uh, that is um, competitive in comparison to other investments. Um, actually, I'll come to these three types of crowdfunding, uh, equity crowdfunding, which is very rare in the culture sector to our reading of the literature. Movies, big, large movie productions might be an exception, but uh, often it's smaller movies. I mean, uh, Sylvester Stallone and Spike Lee have all have all had crowdfunding calls out, but it wouldn't be for the biggest budget movies um, Sylvester Stallone has created, for instance. Um, and uh, yes, so you have equity crowdfunding, you have donation crowdfunding, where you expect no specific um, uh, return either in terms of a product being made available to you sooner or later, or a pecuniary return. And then you have um, remote based crowdfunding. And often the exciting thing is that you can mix these three remote based crowdfunding when you get some something that relates to some kind of use value and uh, the cultural product or service. Um, I get back to it in a minute. So um, thanks for the um, thanks for helping me to to communicate this at this stage. So um, I'm just going to go down the list now, and uh, of course more detail is found uh, in the paper. The first thing to say is that regarding the cost structure, uh, we have a cost structure conundrum in the creative industries and cultural industries. We have to somehow raise the funds before full costs are incurred. Um, and um, uh, sorry, uh, crowdfunding enables us to ra re enables founders, creators to raise funds before the full costs of creation are incurred, um, and that it might help them also to pool risks among various stakeholders. Um, and I think that's reasonably clear. If there are questions to that, I'm happy to discuss that in detail. Um, otherwise, I would immediately skip to the second point. We have the demand uncertainty for creators. They don't don't quite know how much they will sell um, when they, uh, as they are spending their time and money on um, on creating, and also then later to promote. And as we all know, promoting cultural products can be more expensive than creating them. A lot more expensive. We talked about movies there. Even though a movie might cost a hundred million euros, uh, movie production companies sometimes spend even more on promoting something that. Uh, they feel might actually become a blockbuster if there still are such things. Okay, so and the, so crowdfunding enables um, um, creators to test the market, and this is, I think, really quite exciting um, because as cultural economists, we are you know we talk about uh, contingent valuation studies as our daily bread, some of us anyway, and uh, in a sense, um, uh, crowdfunding calls could be looked at as contingent valuation studies, or when you have a series of them as choice experiments. And literally the data is available and um, it is a very nice um, opportunity for research, but of course also stakeholders, uh, practitioners are conducting this. And as we all know, it's in the nature of platforms, of professionally run platforms, that they probably do this also for their own internal purposes and under the veil of business secrets and uh, information silos to a great extent. Um, but some people, maybe some researchers, maybe some people as researchers working for platforms and not publishing uh, might uh, really know a lot about what um, entices people to commit money uh, to creative product uh, projects. And then you also have marketing or building reputation opportunities that relate to crowdfunding. But there's a bit of a catch-22 that I'll get to in a minute. And finally, we also have the, the, the link to match funding, which we don't make a, do a lot of uh, in the paper for obvious reasons of space, that all of a sudden then um, it becomes possible sometimes for enlightened policymakers who are empirically orientated that all of a sudden um, they might look at how somebody performs, not just on social media, but also in terms of crowdfunding, where people actually put their money where their mouth is um, um, before they commit public funding. Um, but to my understanding, that is still a very limited practice. Please do alert me to, to exciting examples uh, that you might be aware of. Third, um, already at the third of eight points, uh, uh, we have the differentiated products and users. Uh, and um, 
what crowdfunding enables is price discrimination as a key crowdfunding benefit for founders. So you have vertical and horizontal differentiation as well as taste for variety in the cultural sector and crowdfunding entices users to reveal information on their willingness to pay. Not as much as, as an auction would, but they have the possibility to decide often um, sometimes there's a minimum threshold set, um, but often um, they have uh, they have an the possibility and use the possibility to pay more than the absolute minimum required to be participate at all or to trigger certain rewards. And then you also have group pricing, menu pricing, or even personalized pricing. And I think the literature so far downplays the personal pricing element or the, 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 the incentives to reveal um, willingness to pay uh, more than you would have with um, group pricing or menu pricing in the in crowdfunding practices. It gets a bit more well. It gets a bit more convoluted and exciting when we talk about incomplete inf incomplete information uh, of users uh, in the paper. We have quality uncertainty even more pronounced uh, that is even more pronounced at crowd at the crowdfunding stage and at the retailing stage this is sometimes overlooked i think in the literature that um, but i would insist that um it is a difference whether i can look at a uh, at a finished product or at least a teaser or something and in particular whether i can observe critics or people who've who've engaged with the finished product and gouge their direction their, their reaction and based on that make my decision whether i pay any attention or even buy into right by by renting watching um uh, buying um, a certain product so um quality uncertainty for crowdfunding should be at the crowdfunding stage should be even more pronounced than at the rate retailing stage which should be a limitation of crowdfunding um, you also have asymmetric information and um, pr um, problems and quality signals that are might help to mitigate them to some extent and might explain much of the crowdfunding practices. In the call design, you have personal uh, personal characteristics of the founder that affect um, people's perception of whether they will, you know, have a trustworthy interaction partner, even though you have to take a leap of faith and buy into a, pro a, a proposition rather than a finished product. You have the reputation and past performance of the founder that people might consider in this respect. And of course, the promise of easy access to a finished good might be a documentation tool. Even if I don't actually care that much or it's going to be staged somewhere else, at least the, the signal that the founder says, you will get access to this or we will provide other parties with access um might provide um a signal that they stand by what they are uh proposing in the call and then um, um so besides the documentation tool issue there's a clever point made by chung in a paper relatively recently uh in the american the american economic association's journal on microeconomics i hope i don't i didn't butcher the name quite so badly but he makes a very clever point that assuming rationality of backers and founders, crowdfunding only works if the founder has, an, has incentives to build the project after funds have been raised, rather than take the money and run. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean take the money and run. It just means that you take it easy and, you know, and like like the famous rock, the notorious rock musicians who got an advance from the record company and spend it all on drugs. <clears throat> Okay, so you have to have some kind of reputation and have to be able to show some reliability from prior project, perhaps, or some commitment to repeat uh, uh, interactions, or this might really not work that well for for newcomers uh, or people um, that don't have much skin in the game, don't have a big don't have a big reputation to lose as well, right? It costs you a lot when you're Neil Young uh, to be seen, be perceived as. Um, um, not treating your customers via crowdfunding calls very well. Um, if you're a nobody, then it costs you virtually nothing and you might as well take the money and, uh, and not do as proposed. We have the crowd, uh, the public good attributes here. People from, I've seen Alexander Kunz from WIPO here. I think his colleague Sally is also here. Um, uh, so, um, this is an exciting dimension that, um, I might, 
I might be working on uh, uh, for other purposes and other papers. So um, what, what crowdfunding does is what Halvarian is called ransom. He, in a 2005 paper, I think, before the crowdfunding term was commonplace, he referred to this idea of telling people, this is what I would do if I had the money, but I'll only do it if you help me uh, as a ransom. And uh, what this does is it increases the excludability of the creative endeavor and averts asset specificity that creators are subject to uh, once they have committed the costs of creation and have a more or less finished good uh, uh, there. So it's a way of circumventing the problem that copyright supposedly um, uh, supposedly helps us mitigate, or some might even say solve. Um, so because you convert free riders to backers, uh, you make people realize and give them an option also to do something about the problem that if they don't help, uh, then this might not be created because you literally create a scenario where that is perceived and is the case. You also have the possibility for personalized pricing, which might help overcome some of the public good attributes because uh, people might, you know, reveal more of the surplus they would have expected at a fixed price and, and pay higher amounts. Um, and you have the assurance problems that are still associated with this because backers consider endogenous effects on backing. And um, they, it will still be, you know, costly, not the best imaginable use of their time to engage with a crowdfunding call. So in a sense, there's a cost involved, even if you get reimbursed, uh, if the uh, the call falls flat and no product, no, no, nothing transpires other than the call itself. And then um, our paper includes some simple formalization, how assurance problems and free riding incentives may aggravate each other. And that may um, use that to explain the convention of all or nothing setups and uh, also of funding, modest funding targets. Some papers, especially the formal, uh, f formal mathematical papers, um, what they literally assume is that um, the uh, founders, people putting out crowdfunding calls, set the costs of creation as the funding target. I don't think that's a, that's a self-evident proposition, but in our paper weeks, uh, we uh, discuss why that might actually be a, um, a common practice for various reasons, because the risk of charging too much might, best, might just be too great. Um, but I can't really do that fully here. If anybody has questions about this, I'd be happy to to do that on demand, so to speak. Then I get to the most, uh, well, one of the more, you know, I'm, as you see, you can see as I graduate into the slightly more advanced pieces of the paper and take put the pieces together, it gets slightly more sophisticated, but also more exciting. Here we have the socially interdependent demand formation um, topic. And uh, I think it's quite exciting to see the ambiguity of quality signals in crowdfunding campaigns. And we try to disentangle those, at least to some extent, or give some food for thought about this in this figure, which has will have two extensions in a minute. The first one is quite obvious. So you have the observable quality of the call as it is displayed on the platform. You have the success of the call so far that most people will see, uh, you know, all but the first one or two uh, visitors of the platform site clicking on this particular link. Uh, we'll see how many visitors there have been, how many, uh, how many uh, founders there have been and so on. So you have two strong um, sources of signals of quality and you have the reputation of the creator that might also come from other sources. People might just simply know these, uh, these creators or have other information from elsewhere. So, and all of that positively affects the perceived quality of the call, and all of that should affect the propensity of the of the pledge, the propensity to pledge, and to attract further pledges. All very well, um, but it's not quite as simple as this. Um, I talked about ambiguity. It's not so. The first one is the free riding incentive, um, and here what's, uh, we we argue in the paper that the success of the call so far might actually trigger free riding incentives, and this might adversely, hence the gray arrow, uh, arrow, adversely affect propensity to pledge. Because if a project will commence anyway, why not, why, why spend money on it, right? 
And then you would need rewards or some kind, kind of other incentives to uh, promote further pledging. If it's um, and of course at some point that they, they will even close, uh, they might even close the um, close the call and no further pledges are accepted, which is an interesting practice which we also try to explain in the paper. But this is uh, um, a side alley that I really won't explore right now. Let me instead talk about assurance problems. Um, so again, these are ambiguous. On the one hand, the reputation of creators um, um, will adversely affect, diminish assurance problems because you could see that they've been treating other parties uh, reliably and they have a lot to lose if they have a big reputation already and if they then get, uh, you know, there was backlash, for instance, for several um, crowdfunding calls when people all of, uh, all of a sudden said, listen, um, my impression is that you, say Spike Lee, are a well-established person. I assume you are much wealthier than I. Why the hell would you ask for selfless donations from my part? Yeah. Um, so the reputation uh, is, is really important. In any case, uh, the reputation might diminish assurance problems because people have shown to be reliable and that might um, um, uh, that would be nice. But there's this final lower bottom uh, um, loop here that the reputation of the creator will also foster creators outside options. You might expect Spike Lee or Sylvester Stallone to be capable of raising money otherwise, unless they failed attracting professional uh, investment, which might of course be adverse select, an, an adverse selection problem, right? So only if uh, you might try to sell it as, you know, this is the, 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 the uh, professionals don't get it. It's too far out, it's too clever or whatever. Okay, you can have it go with this. But of course, some people might suspect that you're giving them the stuff that has failed in all other ways and might not be um, um, the best way forward. And then if you, if creators have better outside options that might um, foster assurance problems and then diminish the propensity to pledge. So it's all actually quite a difficult balance that founders need to strike and of course also backers need to strike, uh, strike but they're usually in it for some enjoyment and not um, since equity crowdfunding is, is an exception in creative industries for them the, the fun of engaging might be more important and they might not spend so much time on convoluted graphs and figures such as this. All right, um, I'm almost uh, done with this, uh, with this kind of flyby uh, ticking the boxes of main themes and cultural economics and crowdfunding. We've got the intrinsic motivation to create story and we argue that there's a trade-off between participation rewards that some crowdfunding calls offer right because apparently users appreciate participating in it's work for the actor maybe also vocation and fun but it's it's a paid occupation for the actor and sometimes uh, other people do it or would like to do it be an extra something uh, for not only for free but actually as something that uh, encourages encourages them incentivizes them to contribute money uh, but on the other hand, of course, any participation uh, participation you reward you offer in a sense might conflict with creators' taste for autonomy because you actually have to get those people <laughs> engaged, right? And they might all of a sudden might make strange movements or or try to make decisions with you or something like that. And then eighth, we have the backers' incentives catering and and then the, the exciting um, uh, possibility of crowdfunding to cater for diverse motives to support creativity. Reward-based crowdfunding um, uh, as the is the cultural uh, and creative industry norm to our reading. Um, so you have access to finished goods as available, uh, also available at the retail stage. That might be that caters for the use value of the product itself. You have the social distinction or community benefits that people like uh, Paul Belflam are um, emphasizing a lot in their assessment. Um, so that people want to distinguish themselves, uh, and of course, that would usually have to that would have to be made visible through attribution or uh, something like that, associated and promised um, to the to the backers. You have exclusive perks, which is a special sale way or closely related to to pre-selling, or just that it's not pre-selling of something, but it's selling of something that you promise will be exclusive like a limited edition or something and then you have the participation rewards or intrinsic uh, creating for the intrinsic motivation to create which i alluded to in point seven 
Um, crowdfunding uh, as a commercial investment is the exception again in our reading. Elisabetta might, might disagree, and I'm happy to take that point, but that's that was our understanding. Um, and it's a bit like in the art, uh, um, like in the art market and artists and investment literature, that um, art often has a non, a slightly uh, has a has a return, an average risk adjusted return on investment below that is weaker than uh, for other um, types of investments by and large, not zero, but but weaker, which might suggest that there is there are other values at stake other benefits to be had from engaging in crowdfunding for uh, for founders who provide money. And then you have donation based crowdfunding. And then, of course, there's the big question that I think is the, the, the vocabulary is really convoluted and the, 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 the separation of terms and concepts is really frustratingly um, frustratingly ill-developed, in my humble opinion, uh, between um, the value of indirect benefits or pure altruism, what is actually altruism and what are indirect benefits, and um, what crowdfunding does in any case is it is allows people to, or that, it, that they can express and translate it into money and help finance uh, creative projects um, um, and get various benefits um, out of it. And that relates also to the last point, crowding in and crowding out. Uh, there's a, a paradox in, at crowdfunding to my understanding. On the one hand, you need, there's a need for selfless contributions, faith, and a community spirit. When you talk about social distinction as a main issue, for instance, as many authors have. Uh, and on the other hand, we can't, we shan't forget that crowdfunding is about raising money. It's about, it has a clear pecuniary component by definition of crowdfunding. Yeah, so we have the usual tension. I'll get to the back to the letter between between you know the, the value of art and the exciting the non uh, the non pecuniary aspects here and uh, and actual literal uh, money transfers uh, that are by definition um, an element of a, a definitorial element of crowdfunding. All right, good. That gets us to the discussion. Um, I've got, I don't see a watch here, and my phone is in the other room. How am I doing for time, Elisabetta? Thank you very much, Christian. So, hey, sorry, I'm not, uh, I'm not done. Sorry, minutes. I'm not done. I, w I was asking how much time oh. I have left. Five minutes to the to the to the hour. So all together, okay. ten minutes because we started uh, a couple of minutes late. Good, including then, discussion. Wonderful, wonderful. Then I'll um, I'll be quick about it, or we can preempt some of this by instigating discussion at any point anybody uh, sees fit. Um, I've got not, not not much left, just quickly a, an explicit answer to the questions I teased in the beginning, the more practical questions, under what circumstances is crowdfunding a superior alternative to traded means of financing uh, innovative projects. Um, so we, we have a little you know, preliminary list. We're not completely satisfied with this. This is work to be continued, but I think we are a few steps ahead of um, uh, of some of the literature. First of all, crowdfunding will be more efficient uh, with greater development costs and more pronounced market failure in commercial finance should be kind of obvious, but sometimes it helps to, to restate and confirm this. Um, we'll, uh, crowdfunding will be more efficient with greater demand uncertainty and greater thus greater benefits for testing the market. Uh, with stronger experience, good attributes as crowdfunding is a means to engage others. And this might work best over a series of calls, as we often see also with uh, with other ways of financing culture that you have to gradually build up a reputation and for triggering social independent valuation processes. Um, we have widely differentiated willingness to pay, um, which is well, which helps because you, uh, crowdfunding usually uh, has greater scope for refined price discrimination, which and helps you cater for a limited of people who are risk seeking or have a very high willingness to pay like i would for my favorite recording artist for instance um and but you need those those fans so to speak and then finally diverse values so that founders may bundle diverse rewards uh, which helps you then extend the market and um, um appropriate surplus um as a crowdfunding founder and the, regarding the prevalence of these conditions and cultural and culture, uh, creative industries, crowdfunding probably fills a sustainable niche. 
which, you know, by the growth and the, you know, it's been around for a decade, for over a decade. So this is maybe not the most exciting point, but um, um, we argue why. Then the second practical question was what types of crowdfunding are best suited for specific culture and creative industries? And CCI have various economic characteristics and crowdfunding is best suited with high upfront capital required. Films, complex video games, or large-scale performances, rather than uh, or as opposed to sound recording literary works. On the one hand, you'll see that this is, doesn't quite add up, but, but this is deliberate, and this is a point I'm trying to make. We have low opportunity costs of time, which might then, um, which might make crowdfunding more desirable, more uh, relatively more efficient to, uh, to its alternatives. Pronounced public good attributes and pre-selling where marginal costs are low which applies to reproducible cultural projects rather than crafts, fine arts or performing arts. And with refunds in all or nothing setup uh, is, is uh, sorry, refunds in all or nothing setups are essential for creators without a strong reputation and social distinction rewards uh, are more promising for prestigious high arts or cultural heritage. What this goes to show is that few of these specific cultural projects, or few, few, if any, specific cultural projects will tick all these boxes simultaneously. And this hints at severe limitations of crowdfunding and cultural creative industries as I see it. And there might be more need for innovation and clever solutions, uh, or uh, it will remain quite limited in my humble understanding which is, of course, pretty much the last question, I, uh, practical question we had, what is the potential for crowdfunding for cultural and creative industries? And we have restrictions of crowdfunding, uh, asymmetric information and quality uncertainty at the crowdfunding stage. I can't emphasize this enough, I think, sometimes really literally overlooked, I, I reckon. Um, you have the crowdfunding, uh, that you have the, the problem that crowdfunding requires many costly interact transactions comparison to raising commercial investments from a bank or a single or a couple of investors, uh, big chunk uh, investors who of course might then of course have the, uh, have the annoying habit of trying to uh, influence the creative project. <clears throat> and third, you have the propensity to pledge uh, that is moderated by free rider incentives and assurance problems. Um, and uh, I made the point about fans before, and you have a paradox that newcomers don't have the reputation to motivate backers, and superstars can hardly make credible threats that they will not produce without crowd uh, crowdfunding because they had good outside options. Good. Um, I have some conclusions, but I made my sales pitch in the beginning. Um, so let me just, without you know, rather the, let me cut this short and not do go over my conclusion slide and just repeat the fact that I think there's huge potential for cultural economics to raise the data, sift through the this uh, this literature and improve on it and relate it to longstanding topics that uh, we've been addressing, because this really is a rich, rich, rich set of, let me call it, contingent valuation studies or maybe even choice experiments that are run and, and documented to a great extent. Very exciting for us. And on the other hand, it's, I think it's really our job to remind people that they're not the first to discuss intrinsic motivation or uh, public good attributes or anything like that and try to sell this as a unique output of their crowdfunding research, ignoring, sidelining some of us who've been working on this for decades. Um, yeah, that's maybe a good point uh, on which to conclude. Thank you for your attention and I hope you'll have some exciting questions left. left. Thank you so much, Christian. A lot of food for thought, uh, a lot of uh, discussion points. Uh, uh, let's, let's see how, and uh, a lot of clapping so, uh, from the audience. Uh, so uh, who would like to do, uh, to intervene, ask a question, uh, respond to the uh, discussion points, many discussion points raised, interesting discussion points raised by Christian and Carolina. Two hands raised, uh, so um, uh, Doug, please. Thanks, uh, and thanks Christian. I I don't have as much a question, <clears throat> although I'll find one in the end, is I just wanted to give a thank you and a lot of praise for this to you and, and for this paper. Um, I, I think it is a extremely valuable addition to this literature. Uh, we need something to help frame in an economic sense and in a particular cultural economic sense, this phenomenon. And you've given us many, many different launching pads 
And it's, this is a very easily citable paper. And I hope that it generates a, a, a mountain of citations for you, not just for you, but for the, for the literature. I think it really helps give some structure to it. So I wanted to say thank you for that. Now, if I were to pivot into a question, part of my question, there's a couple ways to think of it, but it's, so I, I, one thing I like about your paper is I enjoyed it more each time I read it when I don't normally, wouldn't normally say that, but I also found maybe refreshing, but a bit of pessimism about crowdfunding. Uh, in, in what you are writing. And, and so I like that because crowdfunding literature is often full of boosters and advocates and fans. And so it's nice to see someone sort of be a wet blanket for this. But there is this question, if it doesn't work well, why are so many people doing it? And is it all experimentation and this thing won't actually keep growing? It's plateaued in many ways and it might be something that fades. But another way to think of this question is when you look at some of your discussion points about where it's more like discussion one, I think it's crowdfunding will be more efficient when, and I'm kind of wondering more efficient than what? And so part of my question, another way to think of it is if crowdfunding is growing, then is this picking up uh, exchanges and transactions that were previously sort of sub-economic and not previously happening, or is it actually diverting uh, energy away from other institutions? So any of that, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on. Yeah, uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I also uh, enjoy the paper uh, a lot more in hindsight than when I was working. I mean, I was very happy when I had, when I had it done, so to speak, when I was when it was ready for submission. But it was, you know, for a while I didn't know whether it was going to work to create this kind of overview. It was kind of hard to go through the thicket of um, uh, of ideas. But I think, I mean, for me, it was really educational to write this together with Carolina, and I really enjoyed it. And I'm glad to see that new aspects of it, you know, resonate with other people. That's the that's what really I was hoping for. Um, when regarding your point, so you know, if it if it has its limitations and weaknesses, uh, why are people doing that? Uh, first thing to say is, of course, why why aren't more people doing it uh, if it's so great? Yeah, because again, um, it's not like I don't know, um, Arts for America has pivoted entirely to crowdfunding or or you know. We're crowdfunding. Um, we're crowdfunding television um, uh, entirely, right? This is very much still subscription-based and not crowdfunding uh, at all, right? Even though, of course, people might allude and say, you know, yeah, yeah please stick with HBO, otherwise we're not going to do Game of Thrones, whatever spin-offs. Anyway, but um, it, that's not crowdfunding, is it? So why? Uh, that's always the issue with new technologies. Um, of course, also, what niche does it fill? Where is it? Where is it um, replacing? Where is it radical in the sense that it replaces other uh, other things uh, with a superior alternative in the perception of people? So you would still have a have growth at the um, yeah at least uh, welfare growth as a result of this in reasonably functioning markets. Um, more efficient than what is, is something we really should be writing out, right? And I literally am doing it to some extent. So various ways of finance and culture and what are the relative advantages and disadvantages from a microeconomic perspective? Otherwise, why they go crazy? You have to stick with some, some uh, restricting framework uh, or inspiring framework. Uh, completely, we just couldn't fit it into the paper. So where does it eat into? Is it the, you know, the commercial investment by specialized investors like publishers, for instance? Instance, is it cutting into um, the retail market? So uh, people, you know, stop being buyers but start being founders, but then they don't buy anymore at a later stage. So uh, these are all issues that um, I don't think the literature is even re ready yet. So we didn't have that much to summarize. Maybe you have better information than I, but that was my limited reading. Carolina might also hasten to compliment uh, what I would just said, because in all honesty, uh, her overview of the literature is astounding and I, I, I can't rival that at all. Um, yeah, and then finally, regarding the potential in the long run, as with all new technologies, uh, you have an exponential growth pattern at some point, but you never quite know when it will tail off. And I am not so sure whether we are, you know, whether we are tailing off already uh, or whether all the excitement that we've seen is already there. In any case, even if this tailed off already, the data production, the new information, the new exciting literature is there for us cultural economists to relate to, to benefit from and to contribute to. 
And that is something that regardless, even if we forget about crowdfunding in 10 years, we will look back at the golden age of shifting boundaries and exciting new experimentation and how to organize the financing of culture and how to engage people with culture. And that is here to stay. Yeah, I, com I completely agree. And I just to add, add my own personal take on it, I think a lot of what crowdfunding is bringing is more about information than about money. There's a lot more information for researchers, but also for practitioners. There's a lot more information in the crowdfunding universe than there actually is dollar euros. And, and that's partly why I think the counterfactual of more efficient than what begs some interesting information questions. Because while there's asymmetric information with crowdfunding, you move away from crowdfunding, we don't necessarily have a lot more light shed on the situation. It's often even more dark. Crowdfunding yeah. often is really bringing more information out and it's fascinating and we should all be mining it a lot. <laughs> so thank you, Christian. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you very much, Doug. So there is a very last question, Stephen, if it is very quick because we, are already, we have already run out of time. So please go ahead. Okay, Th thank you very much for the opportunity to ask a question. And apologies if this is already well known, but are data available on the spatial distribution of supporters? I mean, they must, the, the, the platforms must have IP addresses of supporters. Do they share some measure of the number of top or secondary level IP addresses where support comes from? Uh, this question I would uh, I would guide to um, Carolina, Doug, maybe Elisabetta, uh, because you know they they know this better than I. There is literature on this. There's an exciting literature about this. Uh, home bias of crowdfunding, I think, is a term that might uh, that might give you good uh, good results. But it really is a, would be a waste of your time for me to answer this question. Doug, do you wanna or do you wanna? <laughs> Point at somebody else. He's published a yeah. paper, several papers on it, I think, by now. Thirty yeah. seconds, so please. Okay, so quick, thirty seconds. Backer data is hard to get because they really treat it privately. But check out NADAC. Uh, Kickstarter just released a, a big data dump through NADAC, and one of the data files they're putting up there is backer geography. But it's only resolved like at the state level uh, or national level. But it, they've got some data at least that they're putting out there. Great, Th thank you All very right. much. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to thank uh, uh, all the the audience uh, and uh, especially the presenters, uh, the, the ones who intervene with the questions and comments. I would like to stress something that Doug, uh, who is co-editor of the Journal of Cultural Economics, uh, very citable paper. So this was a very good hint for all the potential uh, um, um, contributors uh, to the Journal of Cultural Economics, the Journal of our Association uh, International for Cultural Economics. So thank you very much for being with us today and stay tuned because uh, much to come, uh, very uh, exciting uh, of cultural economics uh, seminars online. Uh, so thank you very much, stay tuned uh, and see you next time. Bye bye, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, available bye. for further quest follow-ups uh, via email, okay? Sorry that we're running out of time. Yeah, bye. absolutely. Cheers. Bye bye.